A coastal village in Australia was facing a crisis. The starfish population was growing at an alarming rate. Massive numbers began to overtake the coastal inlet and began to damage the, coast, uh, the, the coral reef. And a group of locals decided they were gonna take matters in their own hand and to uh, destroy these starfish that were uh, invading this area. And so divers went down and began to slice up all of the starfish that they could find, not realizing what they were actually doing. See, if you were to take the same uh, direction and go with a fish or a turtle and try to ex extinct those, you would have found that they would have uh, accomplished their mission. But these were starfish. And starfish are, uh, are very interesting in that fact that if you cut them in half, they will grow to be two starfish. They are uh, in the DNA in a starfish has the ability to reproduce itself. It has the ability to, uh, if one limb comes off, it will grow a new limb or it will become an entirely new fish. And as I think about this starfish analogy, I look at the church that Jesus, as he was raising up his disciples when he came to earth and, and as he was uh, leading them and there were times where there were 3,000 people that would come and follow him. And as he was coming to the end of his ministry, he began to vision cast for the mission and the direction of the church. And he, as he was seeing himself stepping off the scene and that there would be a time when he would be crucified and they were going to slice him up in a sense, they were going to take him out. He was preparing for them and he, he made this statement. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overtake it. The, the, the gates of hell cannot stand against it. And he began at that moment, began to talk about what was going to happen when he passed and when he was gone. And uh, he talked about the Holy Spirit that was going to take his place. And just like it was when he was on earth, there would be this reality that these new disciples that were going to start this church would be able to live in the presence and the power of God, just like they were when Jesus was there. And we can look in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and as the Spirit came in that moment, uh, Peter stands up and begins to preach, and 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus Christ at that moment. And the church bursts onto the scene, and people from all over the world were there, and the church in Jerusalem starts, and some people went back home, but a lot of people stayed right there, and it says the church began to multiply. And as they began to multiply, they began to raise up leaders because the numbers were, were getting larger. And Stephen was one of those leaders that came in and, and began to uh, lead and preach, and, and uh, there was a, a Saul who was a persecutor of the church, and he came and, and uh, he was part of the execution of, of uh, Stephen. And as the uh, time went, the church came under such a great persecution that the church scattered. And I want to look at a passage here in, in Acts 8, uh, uh, verse 1. It says, On that day, of a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. But what happened? What a, what a terrible scene. What happened? But here, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They preached the word wherever they went. Philip, uh, it goes on, it says, Philip went and began to move to uh, Samaria. And, and Peter uh, went to uh, Joppa. And Paul eventually 
uh, came in contact with Christ and he became a follower of Jesus. See, the church was like the starfish. No matter, um, no matter what it came against, it was going to overcome. It grew to a point that it was invading and making it difficult for other people who were not followers of Jesus that didn't want to be a part of that. It was multiplying and under the persecution, it even multiplied more and it would not die. When the persecution, it would not die because people went on and, was, and the church became unstoppable. You know, I think about what we've just been going through, this global pandemic. It wasn't a huge persecution on the church. It was just an inconvenience for many of us. And in this time of, of the pandemic, um, some of us thrived. Man, we saw people stepping up and doing some really awesome things. Some people just survived and others um, just kind of got stuck. And I think of, um, you know, as I see what happened and I, as I witnessed this whole last year, what I, what I be began to see is, is uh, you know, the fact that on Easter, all so many auditoriums were closed and so many churches that were not prepared to go online by Easter, they had it figured out. And on Easter, there were thousands and thousands of churches all over the world that were watching and people were sitting in their homes and they were watching the powerful message of the cross and the gospel was going out like never before in our lifetime. And life groups were sitting around their uh, their. their living rooms, not with people in it, but sitting on, on Zoom and watching and talking and interacting on, on a new technology that, were many, that was new to many, and people were trying to figure out how to get connected, and, and, uh, and it was awesome to see the church still gathering, even though we couldn't come into the auditoriums. And leaders stepped up, and they cared for their, their leaders and, they, uh, and their, uh, their members and began to uh, care for them and, and love them. And, and people who were in, connected in life group were in growing, and, and as they were struggling through their time together, they were encouraged. And, you know, uh, we have a care team, and care team was stepping out and really caring for people, calling people, and loving people, and working with them in, in powerful ways. And then, we, uh, when I think of, you know, look at the, the, the offering, it was amazing. I thought when the doors would close in the auditorium, things would really be, would step back. And, and it, as I look at, at the, uh, the month of April, we had probably the highest uh, contributions to family church on record. And it was just awesome to see what, how God's people in this very challenging time, time of uncertainty, people stepped in. But for many, um, it, was, it was a struggle. And as I look at it, the church was not prepared for what we were headed into. When the auditorium doors closed and people weren't able to get in, many people just struggled because it, church was so much about being here on the weekend. And this weekend, we're starting a new sermon series called Unstoppable. We're going to talk about, for the next few weeks, the Unstoppable Church. And we're going to look at today at the book of Ephesians, or just chapter one of Ephesians. In the chapter one of Ephesians, we begin to look at a picture that, that Paul writes about the church, the unstoppable church. And we're going to draw out four characteristics, four DNA characteristics that are part of the church that makes it unstoppable. It's the church is the people of God. The church is this filled with the spirit of God. The church is uh, filled with the power of God. And the church is on mission to accomplish the, 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 the work of God. And so... Um, if you got your Bibles, you can turn to, to Ephesians 1. I'm going to have it on the screen here. And uh, we're going to begin to, to look at, at this, uh, this passage. So the first thing is the church is the people of God. Now, when you think of church, what do you think of? For many people, they think of a building. And you say, well, today it's time, we're, it's time to go to church. And we think of it as a, a building. We think of it as a day of the week. Where today is Sunday. It's the day we go to church. We think of it as a, as a location. It's uh, this part of town. We think of it as an, an event. And in reality, this is the building where the gathered 
congregants come together, where the church comes together in the building, and when the when the service is over, the church leaves the building. But this is just the building that the church is in. It is not the church because the church really is a people. It's really people who are working and people who are playing and people who are eating together. This is a church scattered. And I believe what I have been thinking about during this COVID season is we are so used to focusing on the church gathered how much have we thought about the church scattered? How much have we thought about the fact that when the church is, uh, is, is not in the location, is not in the building, the church is still going 24-7 wherever you're at? Because the church is the people of God. And, I, and in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, I'm going to draw your attention to this passage, this beautiful passage that says, and Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Many years of my life, I have looked at my relationship with God as if I did X, Y, and Z, God would bless me. I was so excited when I came, having even read this for many, many times, and it really occurred to me that we have been blessed. He has blessed us in, every, in, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessings. We've been blessed. The church is the people of God who have been blessed. It says, and it, from there, it, it, it begins to list a number of things. And just a couple things I want to bring out. He, the one thing is, based on his love, he chose us. And he chose us to be his church. He's chose us to be part of his family. And there's a, a passage in, in uh, Ephesians 2 that says, it is for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. And you see that God is giving us the opportunity of a gift Salvation is a gift. Being able to receive the blessings of God is a gift that it comes by faith. And when we place our faith into Christ, faith is an action word. It's, I take a step. I take a step to follow Jesus. It is a, it is a decision that I, I'm just not going to believe in Christ and then live the rest of my life how I want. It's really saying I'm... I'm going to come into a relationship where we're going to do this together and I will become a follower of Jesus. And this is done by grace. By grace are you saved through faith. So in this chapter one, we see we're chose by God. We're adopted into his family. We are forgiven of all sins and God has extended his grace to us. That is such a, a, a powerful thing to me because I think that when you think about who God is, when you think about what you believe God to be, what is your view? When I, you know, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist in many ways to the point where I'm never satisfied with what I do I always think there's some way I could have done that better. And I'm made in the image of God, but in some way I made God in the image of me. So I took a picture of God in the sense that if I'm not satisfied with myself, God could not be satisfied with me. And I didn't see God as a, as a wonderful, beautiful, loving God. I believe that because that's what the Bible, but I didn't experience that. What I experienced was a very hard God, a God who was, um, who was never satisfied with what I could accomplish. And so here I was um, struggling to really relate to God because I had put a face on God of myself. Some people put a face of God of their father and they said, if, if I can't, I had, a, I had a really rough relationship with my father and I don't, I don't see how God, because he's a father, I, I just don't. But God is, God is a gracious God. And, I, God, and I, what I want you to see, I, I, I want to see the language of this, of this wonderful God. Isn't this, I mean, God is 
chosen us. God has adopted us. We were, need, we were in need of adoption. God forgave us of our sin, and he extended his grace to us. And let me just go on, and there's a couple of verses that I want to draw your attention to. In verse 7 and 8, it says, In him we have this redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches. In accordance with the riches. Not out of. If I, if I had if I had $100 and I gave you out of that, it could be a penny. <laughs> it could be a dollar. If I, if, I, if, if, you, if I gave you that in accordance, you had, we shared the same amount. You had what I have. We have this forgiveness. We have this redemption. We have this grace in accordance with the riches of God's grace. That, look at, I love it. He lavished on us. Can you see the generous, loving, compassionate father who desi desired to send his son so that he could, he could redeem us. In, in chapter 2, another part, he says, and God raised us up in order that in the coming ages that he might show his incomparably riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Oh, the idea that God is a, is a critical angry God is missing the picture because when I come to the place where he is a loving wonderful father it changes me to be where I am responding in love I think motivation and when I think about this I had this life uh, awareness when I was in junior high and when I was I was sitting at a breakfast table lived out in the country, and sitting at a breakfast table one morning, um, I, monthly our family would go uh, to town and buy groceries and stuff, and it was almost an all-day thing, and I just hated to go to town. I would rather just stay home. I remember this one day at breakfast, I asked again, could I stay home? And often it was, well, I think you should go. And so this particular day, son, uh, Saturday morning, my dad said, um, yeah, but what would you do? And I said, well, I don't know. And it wasn't too much after that while I was eating my oatmeal, um, the thought crossed my mind to say, I'm going to mow the lawn. And I'm not going to tell them. When they come home, they're going to be so excited. And when, I, and when they left, they, um, you know, it took them all morning to get, it seemed like, to, to leave the house. And my mom goes and gets in the car. My dad is headed out the door. And just before he closed the door, he opened it up again. And he says, hey, Ed, since you're not going to town, why don't you mow the lawn? I was ready based on the, the, the love that I had for my dad, the, based on the, the opportunity that he was giving me that day, I was ready to, I was ready to go out and mow the lawn and just, just, you know, be, it would do something in me and it would do something when they got home, they'd go, Ed, you mowed the lawn? Well, thank you, great. And that motivation of love flipped to a motivation of obligation. Oh, I mowed the lawn, but it took me to the end and about the time I thought okay I guess they're coming home all right and I mowed the lawn but I didn't do it in a very happy way I was upset I was mad and I lost the opportunity to love and I think there's so many people that are that hear and read these stories but they don't have the motivation that says look at who God is and motivated by love and gratitude and worship we are working to try to get God's approval and he's you already have it so we're people of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit of God. And there's a, early, next in the line there in Ephesians 1, it says, and you were included in Christ when you, you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When you heard the gospel and believed in your heart, you became a child of God. And the what a transaction took place. The Spirit of God made its home in you. And you became a part of God's family. And something came alive in you. The Holy Spirit brought life into you. I think of the Old Testament tabernacle. And the, and the people uh, in that day would, would have their tents located as, as the people of God uh, and, they, and God dwelt among them in the tabernacle. In the daytime, there was a, a cloud, and, the, and at night, there was a fire. 
And boy, you better be paying attention to, the direction, to, to, the, to what was going on at the temple and the tabernacle because when it was time to move the tent, you better start taking your tents down because you're going to get run over by everybody else that had to move because the tent was moving. So you paid attention to the, to the Spirit of God. That, and the fact is that the Spirit of God now is living in us. We are now the tabernacle. We are now the temple. We are now the dwelling place of God. He does not live in a building. He lives in this building. He lives in you. You, the church, have Christ in us, and all of us have Christ like that, I just think of that starfish that you cut any piece of it and it's, and it's still got the same DNA in every aspect of the part of it. And, and every one of us has all this DNA of being people of God filled with the spirit of God. And I see that we are sealed with their security in this. There is uh, identification in, in this sealing. And it goes on to say, The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing. We have a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I am in God's family. If I've got the Spirit in me, I'm in God's family. I'm secure. My future is heaven. And I belong to God. I I no longer belong to myself. I am now part of God's family, and I now belong to God. The Spirit of God lives in me. So, filled with the, with the Spirit of God, and one of the fruits, one of the evidences that you are um, walking in the Spirit is that you have love, that you have joy, that you have peace, that you have patience. What is it? I mean, if, if the Spirit of God in, is in us and we have, this is kind of who we are, these are the characteristics of the Spirit of God. In it. Why is it that this sometimes is so hard to have this to be up, you know, full and overflowing? Um, I think of my own journey and I think that, that often my control, I just, I want to be in control. And when things don't go right, I, I lose patience and, um, and I get upset and I lose peace. And I lose joy because my plan didn't get carried out. And the Holy Spirit is our source. And and as we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, he is available for us 24-7. You know, I think of of the the fact that, that, uh, that God is right there for you that God is, is available for you to, be, to walk in the Spirit. You know, um, I can remember a, a, a early in my marriage that um, I ran out of gas driving somewhere, and I was, I was in a hurry like normal. Um, and I can remember how humiliated with my new wife in the car, and um, I had no money in my pocket. I, was, um, I had to rely on somebody else, and um, it, I probably you have maybe done the same thing, and how uh, awful that was for me to be standing along the side of the road trying to find somebody that would give me gas. And the fact is, is what would it have been like if I would have had a a gas can in my trunk that I forgot about, and all I had to do was go to there and, and refill my my tank. But I didn't think about the gas can in my trunk because I always went to the gas station and always filled it there. And in some ways, in that crazy analogy, we often are going to another source on a regular basis, which is usually about me and what I'm going to do in my life. When we have this unlimited source of power and, and, and of, of overflow with the Holy Spirit that will give us love and joy and peace and patience. But I must trust the Spirit. I must surrender to the Spirit for him to accomplish in me what he has. Not only do we have the, are we people of God, the church is also filled with the Spirit of God and we're fueled by the power of God. When I think of uh, this, there's a powerful verse as it goes on in Ephesians, which says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Part of the, the, uh, 
the riches that the Spirit of God brings is, is the awareness. And, and I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you were been called and the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his, look at this, his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. The church has power. What kind of power? Incomparably to, I mean, it's, 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 it's the power that, that God spoke and Jesus worked at creation. It's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. We have this power that's living in us. What an what a amazing thing. I think of, um, I, I think of power in, in many ways, but one is the transformation that, brings, that, that comes. And I think of the, the story of Paul, who was Saul and persecuting the church and, and creating all kinds of chaos for the church. And one day he's going out to carry out that and destroy the church some more. And he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he, and he meets him, and, and once, he, once he knows who Jesus is, he's never the same. And, and a powerful transformation happens in Paul. And, and his name is moved from Saul to Paul. And he's writing this, he, this, this, what he is experiencing now. And he's understanding and painting a picture of the church as a transformed follower of Jesus Christ. And when... And, and when we come to faith in Christ, the Spirit of God is in there to transform us to be more like Jesus. And it gives us the power to, be, to overcome the sin. In Romans, it talks about that how that we are no longer a master to sin, that now it's a choice because uh, we have the power to overcome. And we have uh, also the ability to live worthy of our calling. In chapter four of Ephesians, it talks about live worthy and, and live with patience and humility and gratitude. Live in a life that's worthy of calling. And also you're, you have a power to overflow with the gospel. Christ in you, that is, when you have this beautiful, wonderful God who you, uh, who you, you are responding in worship and gratitude, and you're seeing the power of the Spirit that is working in you, that, that is giving you joy and peace and patience as you surrender to him, you are living the gospel. And the gospel it has the opportunity to overflow in your life. I think of uh, just recently I was... I was uh, had the opportunity to go up the North Umpqua and see some of the damage of the fires. And, I, and then recently I came uh, through the uh, McKinsey. And as we've, Robin and I traveled those areas, very familiar, beautiful areas that were devastated by the fires and the number of houses and so that have been destroyed. Um, you know, tears were just running down our face about the loss and, the, and, and sadness. And I, as I drove up to McKinsey, I, I looked and I was aware of a pastor friend of mine whose house was survived and the houses all around were, were destroyed and the power of God that, that kept his home safe. And he had, this, he had this, re, this, this guilt that why was my house staved? And how to, but, it, but through that, God give him time maybe to help the neighbors and, and love them and, and they could see the gospel in my friend Dean. And then I have other friends who lost everything. And it was the, the destruction of, the, of, the, of all that they had. And, and, uh, and they're going to need the power of God to walk through the loss and the pain. And the world looks on and the gospel overflows as they see Christ in them that is, uh, that is at work. And just, you know, uh, this week we had a fire and near us, it was only three miles, of 200 acres, and we could see the glow coming over the mountain, and I was, I was, you know, there was a fright, and Robin began to get us ready to, to evacuate, and all those kind of things, and we were so aware of that because of all that we've seen recently, and I thought, I can remember just finding peace in the fact that whatever happens, God 
will give me the power to endure or the power to, uh, to rise above, to overflow or, and to overcome. The power to overflow and the power to overcome. That's what we have in Christ Jesus. So God is, the church is the people of God with the filled with the spirit of God who are fueled by the power of God so that we can accomplish the mission of God. God has given us this mission that we are on. And there's this passage at the end of Ephesians and it says God placed, and he talks about the authority of Jesus and God has placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which he is, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills everything in every way. The fullness of him that fills everything in every way. You know, those little starfish got, uh, got taken out or tried to take out because they were invading and they were invasive to the area. And Jesus is saying, I want my church to be saturating, going everywhere in every place around the world. And we are the church. We're not the building. We're the church that will go out and make an impact wherever we go. And he's equipped us to do that in Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Today, right where you are in your life, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your workplace, your uh, life is a unique mission field that God has specifically placed for you. How are you doing? Are you, are you living the church? Are you, are, you, are you seeing yourself as the people of God? Are you experiencing the overflow and the power of the spirit of God who is overflowing and, and, and overcoming the challenges of your life? And are you, are you understanding that God has placed you on a mission for you to live? couple things about the mission. The first thing is live for God's kingdom. If I'm going to live the mission, I've got to live on God's kingdom. Every morning when I wake up, I wake up to Ed's mission, Ed's kingdom. And I've got some good plans. I got, I got some things that I really want to do. And uh, I, have to tur- I have to sacrifice. I have to step away. I have to surrender to God's plan because once I start going down there, that road, and it begins to come into challenge then uh, I, can either, I can either say, okay, God, I guess this is your plan, or I'm going to get angry and frustrated and worry about my plan. I can think about a day a number of years ago in 20, 1995, I was working and in, in leaving a parachurch Christian organization, and I was dreaming and felt God calling me to plant a church in the green district of Roseburg. And we were looking at houses and whatnot, and then um, as we... Uh, left that ministry, a number of turn of events happened where we were unable to move down there. And I was angry. I was upset. I was frustrated. But looking back, I wasn't ready. I, did, I didn't have the DNA that I'm speaking about today. God has done a great work in my life to this point. And now um, I needed to, to, to re- readjust some things. And in 2013, Family Church planted a campus. And it was a few months later that I realized that the dream that God placed in me took a few more years before he was ready to, to bring it to fruition. But I had to let him live out his kingdom and let him do it in his timing. And it was done in a very different way than I would have. But his kingdom and not my own. And then he has on his mission is to make disciples. We are here to, go, to make disciples, it says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, make disciples of all nations. And real quickly, what does it look like to make a disciple? Three real quick points. Learn how to have spiritual conversations. Learn how to have spiritual conversations. Do you have friendships that are people that don't know Christ? See, discipleship doesn't happen after somebody comes to Christ. Disciple making happens when you are building a friendship, no matter where they are on the scale from seeker to steward. 
Disciple making is really spiritual uh, friendship. Do you have a friendship? Are you sharing your story? Are you hearing their story? Are you asking questions? Are you making disciples? Disciple making is also about following the prompting of the Spirit. As you learn about the Spirit, as you walk in the Spirit, are you praying for opportunities and are you is, is the Spirit of God, are you learning how to follow the, the open door and find it and speak and when the door is shut to wait for that opportune time? And are you finding a discipleable person? Last week, you know, Pastor Jason talked about loving people, all kinds of people. And some of us were pretty, you know, kind of uncomfortable about some of the, the people that God has called us to love. But we are to find people to love, but we're also to find those people who are what we might call disciples. Well, not everybody is ready. Not everybody is, is, um, is ripe. You know, when you go pick and uh, go out to harvest, harvest isn't every day. Harvest is a season. And some people are ready to be uh, harvested and some are not. And so some people are ready to, to, to spend time t- with you, to talk and to show interest and, and uh, follow Christ with you through spiritual conversations. But I want us to, to think about as we end all that God has for us. It says this in Ephesians 3.20, Now God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power, that his work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We are the church. We are God's people filled with the spirit of God, filled with the power of God for the mission of God. And God says, whatever you can imagine, he can do more. More, immeasurably more. And God wants to do immeasurably more through you, through the church, through all of us. And he has given us the power to do so. And today, you have... Uh, the power for, to accomplish that. Will you, will you be the church? Will you see the church as what God has, uh, has laid it out here in, first, in, in Ephesians 1? And may God bless us as we become that unstoppable uh, mission of God with the power of God in us as you live out the mission right where you're at. I'm going to release this to your pastor that will walk through the next step.